He shared four of the things the individual looked for when investing his money. He figured that the fastest way to increase his wealth was to invest in a company that could sustainably grow their earnings at a fast pace for a really long time. So the first thing he wanted was for the company to be small because large companies by nature tend to not really have long growth runways ahead. The second thing he wanted was for the business to be relatively unknown. Phelps writes, quote, Popular growth stocks may keep on growing, but too often one has to pay for expected growth too many years in advance, end quote. So first, the company must be small. Second, it has to be relatively unknown, so it isn't trading at a too expensive of a price. And then third, it must have a unique product that can do a job better, faster, or cheaper than their competitors, or provide a new service with prospects of great and long-continued sales increases in the future. And then finally, fourth, is that it must have a strong, progressive, research-minded management team, which is something we talk a lot about here on the show. The interesting one I wanted to highlight here is look for a business that's relatively unknown. It can be easy for us to look for companies that a lot of other people have invested in. And one of the reasons is because that company has been through a thorough research process by some really smart people like super investors. But choosing not to rely on the research of others really forces you to do your own research. And it becomes so much more rewarding for us if the pick actually plays out. Companies that are small and not owned by institutions likely offer the biggest upside potential because it becomes a game of turning over a lot of rocks and looking where no one else is looking. And today, this oftentimes leads people to microcaps because these are businesses that are really small, they're relatively unknown, and their values are between $50 million and $300 million. So it's not an area that a lot of people look. One of Phelps' biggest takeaways from studying this investor that did really well was that he bought right and he held on. He wasn't trying to trade in and out of different things and he wasn't incurring unnecessary friction in his portfolio, such as capital gains taxes and trading costs and commissions and the spreads you have to pay on buying and selling. There are two other lessons he shared related to buying right and holding on. And the first is that you should stay with your most successful stock investments as long as the companies are continuing to increase their earnings. It reminds me of Stig's recent episode with Monish Pabrai, where Monish said that if you buy a high-quality compounder, you should hang on to it when it becomes fully priced and still hang on to it when it becomes overpriced. The reason for this is because there are very few companies that are able to compound at high rates for a really long time. So if you were to sell a really big winner, you're taking the chance that wherever you reallocate that money will be put into something that will do even better than the high quality company you already owned. And then you have to take into consideration capital gains taxes, which is a really high bar. The second lesson Phelps had is to be weary of people who tell you to take money off the table because oftentimes their interests are counter to your interests. For example, a stockbroker makes money when you continually trade in and out of positions. Phelps says, who is talking often means more than what is said. And again, this points to the incentives of the individual. Always look at the incentives. To round out the first chapter, Phelps has this quote in there that I absolutely love from George Baker. To make money in stocks, you have to have the vision to see them, the courage to buy them, and the patience to hold them. Patience is the rarest of the three, end quote. He has another excerpt here later in the book that I thought fit really well in here. I quote, I don't know which is harder, buying right or knowing enough to hold on. Mathematically, if you just stick pins into the quotation page, you have not one chance in 100 of hitting a stock that will give you a hundredfold appreciation, even if the future is as good as the past, which is no certainty. And after you have bought your stock, some of the best brains in Wall Street will be trying to persuade you to sell it and buy something else. Lots of times, they'll be right, at least for the short term. Every time they're right, it will make it harder for you to heed their advice the next time. And the next time, they may be advising you to sell your 100 to 1 stock after it has gone from 1 to 2, end quote. He has this good bit on market timing. He writes, there's another reason why professional investors should de-emphasize market timing. That is because even if the market forecaster is right, he seldom can persuade others to act on his opinion. No one intends to buy stocks at the top of the market or sell them at the lows. 
On the contrary, bull market highs are made when the outlook for still higher prices is most broadly convincing. Conversely, bear market lows are made when the likelihood of still lower prices seems overwhelming to the preponderance of reasonable, well-informed investors. Since bull and bear markets are to a considerable extent manifestations of changes in mass psychology, it is fatuous for anyone to believe that he can persuade a representative group of investors to sell stocks when that mass psychology is bullish or to buy stocks when it's bearish. The wise professional who understands this concentrates on stock selection. Most investors are far less emotionally involved in deciding whether the market is going up or down. To clinch the argument, it is readily demonstrable that far more money can be made by good stock selection than by good stock market timing, end quote. There's one more quote a little bit later about market timing that I wanted to share here as well because I just think it's such a good point. Some will argue that good market timing plus good selection is better than either alone. Bear market smoke gets into one's eyes and blinds him to buying opportunities if he's too intent on market timing. And the more successful one is at market timing, the greater the temptation to rely on it and thus miss the much greater opportunities in buying right and holding on, end quote. Now, when you're buying a company that's increasing their earnings year after year and thus increasing their intrinsic value year after year, oftentimes these great companies will be continuing to hit new all-time highs. So even if the multiple contracts from, say, a multiple of 30 to a multiple of 25, you still may be purchasing a stock at a higher price because the earnings of the company have increased to make up for the difference. Phelps discusses mistakes that are made by professional investors that prevent them from buying and holding big winners. He argues that the answer in why professional investors don't succeed in this strategy is found in investor psychology and statistics. He says few investors, private or professional, seek the big game. They focus on chances to make 5 points here and 10 points there. Then he later writes, For the individual or institution really out to make a fortune in the stock market, it can be argued that every sale is a confession of error. Let this not be construed as advocating hanging on to everything willy-nilly. The only thing worse than making an investment mistake is refusing to admit it and correct it. Usually, the faster an error is rectified, the less it costs. But it's still an error, a lost opportunity compared with the buying right and holding on. In a bull market, correcting mistakes often means taking profits. But when we do so, let us not kid ourselves when we're making money. The truth is we are acknowledging missing vastly bigger opportunities and incurring a capital gains tax liability along the way, end quote. He then explains the difficulty investors have with rising and falling stock prices. People naturally assume that a rising stock price correlates with a good investment and a falling stock price correlates with a bad investment. But sometimes great companies see their stocks fall and bad companies see their stocks rise. The second fallacy he highlights is that investors tend to overemphasize the risks of being in stocks and underestimate the cost of not buying in or sitting on the sidelines or selling a stock too early. Even today, after the incredible bull market we've seen, there are countless examples of people who sold a great company too soon, only to watch the stock price continue to increase after they sold. Phelps says that selling too soon can be frightfully expensive. He points out that if a stock manages to compound at 20% per year, then it takes 25 years to take $1 and turn it into $100 or reach 100 bagger status. During this 25 year period, if you happen to sell in year 20, then you get less than 40 to 1 on your money, and the remaining $60 that you missed out on happens in the last 5 years. He then expands on that and says that you shouldn't sell an investment for a non-investment reason. A few examples he shows of this being the case is selling just because you believe the stock price is high, selling just because you have a profit, the stock price is no longer moving like other stocks are, or something that is going on in the news headlines. Now, one of the biggest troubles with finding high quality compounders is that they're often trading at pretty high valuations, and this is what keeps people from getting into them. Of course, you don't want to completely ignore valuation as paying a ridiculously high price can definitely get investors in trouble. But Phelps recommends when you find a company that offers a really attractive prospects and is at a fair valuation to enter a position and be ready to buy more if it happens to trade at a lower price in the future. 
His reasoning is that you want to focus on the long-term business fundamentals, and whether the stock is at a PE of 15, 25, or 35, it really doesn't matter too much when you look out 10 or 20 plus years, because over the long run, the returns of the stock tend to approach the returns of the underlying business, as long as you aren't paying a ridiculously high PE, like say a PE of 100. Another common error that Phelps warns against is doing substantial research on a company and not allocating enough capital for it to really make a difference if it does play out as you'd expect. Hey everyone, it's Clay Fink here. Are you looking for an investment opportunity in a $2 trillion market? Look no further than Atacama, the cybersecurity industry's latest game changer. Atacama has opened its doors to US accredited and international investors alike, already attracting over 5,000 investors and $6.5 million in capital. Atacama's recurring revenue model saw 10x revenue expansion in 2022 alone. They have patented technology and large contracts secured, including one with the U.S. Department of Defense. This is a limited time opportunity to get in on the ground floor of a rapidly growing cybersecurity startup. To learn more, simply visit invest.atacama.com WSB. That is invest.atacama. A-T-A-K-A-M-A dot com slash W-S-B. Full disclosure, I have personally invested in Atacama's equity crowdfunding round at a $29 million valuation. Please keep in mind that investments in early stage companies do contain risk. As with any investment, crowdfunding investments do offer attractive potential upside, but they cannot offer any guarantees of a future return. Phelps starts to dive into the characteristics he found in the hunter baggers in his research. He writes, the only way to make more than the going rate of return on your capital is to buy values not apparent to most people at the time you buy. Because every stock buyer wants to make money, it's almost a truism that nothing kills a money-making opportunity faster than its widespread popularity. It is true that time is on the side of the growth stock buyer if the growth and the expectation of growth continue. This is simple arithmetic. The price of a growth stock will increase year by year at whatever rate the earnings grow if the stock's P.E. ratio remains constant, end quote. So, for example, if we have a stock that has a P.E. of 25 and the company's earnings grow by 15%, then if the P.E. ratio remains constant, then it must be true that the stock price has also increased by 15% as well. And then to his point that nothing kills a money-making opportunity faster than widespread popularity, this is what keeps me from buying into a lot of the market's most popular companies because so many investors have already piled into them and a lot of the growth is already priced into these really popular companies. A highly valued growth stock can do really well as an investment. It just needs a lot of things to go right for it. It needs to continue growing at a high rate of return or have accelerated growth. It needs to have the market expect for that growth to continue or in other words, the market needs to keep it at a high P.E., and then it can't have a really big multiple contraction. And you need to ensure that the discount rate in the market doesn't increase substantially because if the market uses a higher discount rate, then this can significantly bring down the value of growth stocks because a lot of their big cash flows are priced far out into the future, say five or 10 years from now. And that's a lot of what happened in 2022 with a lot of the no profit companies just getting absolutely obliterated. Related to Phelps's point on finding something that the market doesn't find apparent, you have to have a different forecast than the market. If the market expects a company to grow earnings by four times over the next five years, and you agree with the market, then there probably isn't much money to be made because the market has already priced it in. And that's why we should always try to come up with a conservative intrinsic value estimate of what we believe a company is worth and only purchase if the market price is well below our conservative estimate of value. Phelps writes, to win in the stock market, as in checkers, one must think at least one move further ahead than the other fellow, end quote. In a perfect world, you would ideally have what Chris Mayer referenced in his book, The Twin Engines of Growth, a stock that increases its earnings by 40 times and its P.E. multiple increased by two and a half times, then that gives you a hundred bagger. For example, say the earnings per share go from $1 per share to $40 per share, and then you have a P.E. multiple that starts at 15, and then it goes to around 37.5. So definitely a low multiple is preferred when purchasing these compounders, but it certainly isn't a requirement. 
Multiples can also give you a good sense of the sentiment around a company. Low multiples are typically associated with poor sentiment, so you should be mindful that if you pay a higher multiple, the business's earnings can continue to increase, but the multiple might fall or it might normalize. And also, if you're paying a higher multiple, you can't purchase it speculating that the multiple will continue to expand. So buying something on the cheaper end definitely can give you a larger margin of safety because you're not only benefiting from the earnings going up, but you're also potentially benefiting from multiple expansion. Helps expands more on where to find potential 100 baggers. He lists a number of different things here, and it's funny that the first thing he lists is one I totally disagree with. He says that the record of the last 40 years suggests that first you want to look for inventions which enable us to do things we always wanted to do but never could do before. And he uses the examples of an automobile, airplane, and television. And all three, I believe, are really bad industries to be in, mainly because there's just so much competition nowadays and there's low return on invested capital in these industries. Using the auto industry as an example, when you have so many different companies competing, it tends to turn into competing on price, which drives down profit margins for everyone. But when you look at a company like Tesla, who's doing much different things than the traditional players, or a company like Ferrari, who's a luxury automaker, then it becomes a different story. Ideally, you want to be in an industry where you're investing in the clear winner and the industry isn't cluttered with many different players. It's dominated by just one or two players. And that's the type of situation where I believe you've seen super normal profits and very high investor returns. One example that comes to mind here is Alphabet or Google and their search business. They had practically no competition and they were able to earn super normal profits over the last decade. So if you were to apply Phelps principle today of looking for industries with new inventions, things that come to mind here are AI, autonomous driving, electric vehicles, e-commerce, the cloud, and renewable energy. On Phelps's list, he does list ideas within this line of thought, whether that be looking at technology that make things better, faster, cheaper, more efficient, or whether that be new or cheaper sources of energy. Out of the 365 companies that increased by 100-fold in his study, he broke them all down into four general categories. The first is the advance of companies who recovered from extremely depressed prices during the Great Depression, which was the greatest bear market in American history. And then this also includes, more generally, companies that had a special type of panic or distress that caused their stocks to fall dramatically before recovering. Phelps personally doesn't bank on finding these super distressed situations because people's willingness today is to risk higher inflation rather than risk another deflationary bust like what happened in the Great Depression. And after seeing what happened in the overall markets with the Great Financial Crisis in March 2020, we know that the Fed will provide liquidity to the markets wherever necessary, at least for the time being, and they're willing to risk inflation if that's the way things head. The second group of companies in his study was those who produce a basic commodity. If an oil producer, for example, sees the price of oil go up by, say, 5x, then oftentimes you'll see many oil producers increase by multiples much higher than that. Or maybe a company has a big unexpected discovery of a basic commodity that thus leads to explosive stock returns after the discovery is announced. The third group of companies he lists here is the advance of those primarily due to great leverage in capital structure in long periods of expanding business and inflation. For this item, Phelps writes, leverage opportunities may result from situations where the senior claims on a company's earnings and assets equal or exceed those earnings or assets, leaving no present value for the equity. When such a situation persists for many years with no visible prospect of change, the equity may sell at a nominal price. Opportunities for profiting by capital leverage are easy to find. What is hard is deciding whether the added profit potential outweighs the added risk, end quote. And then the fourth and the final one is where the fun stuff is, in my opinion, and that is the growth of companies who reinvested their earnings at substantially higher than average rates of return on their capital. One of the most important pieces when analyzing those in this category is ensuring that these businesses have a really impenetrable moat in place because businesses that earn really high returns are naturally going to attract a lot of competition. It's kind of a new way of me looking at things is uh, what I call the circle the wagons approach to investing. And, you know, this year, 
For example, Buffett in his letter mentioned that Berkshire has a few truly extraordinary businesses, many pretty good businesses, and a very large number of mediocre or below average businesses. 